and I'll write in the chat that we're recording. Good morning, everybody. Let me give everybody a chance to get into the session. Dr. Harrington, if you would say hello in the chat, maybe, and then I will be able to make you a co-host. I think for now we will we'll go ahead and have everybody turn their video feed off, please. On the bottom left, you'll see an icon with a camera and you can click that to stop your video. That will ensure that we have a good uh, video feed from presenters coming to everybody else. But if everybody's video is turned on, then that bogs down the, uh, the Zoom feed. Got lots of last minute people wanting to get in and getting a hold of me. So uh, I'm juggling a couple of different things here. Um, still looking for Dr. Harrington. If you're in there, sir, let me know in the chat so that I can give you sharing privileges. Having a little bit of difficulty getting him on. And we've got someone who cannot hear. Yeah, I'm sending directions. Christina, if you could try to give Jace a hand with troubleshooting his audio, please. No problem, Jace. Glad you got it working. Okay. So I'm in, Graham. Oh, there we go. Okay, sorry. Tom Harrington is in the building. Yeah. Good to see you, sir. Okay. <laughs> I've made you a co-host now so you can share, and then it looks like you might be muted still. Uh, I'm on, right? 
Can you hear me? Nope. There's a. Um, I can hear you. Can hear him. Him. Make sure there's. That's not Graham. crossed through. Okay. I don't think but, Graham can uh, hear any of us. Graham, can you hear us? No. Nope. He's no. out of the loop, I guess. Yeah, I don't. Graham's audio must have done. <laughs> All right. Uh, there we go. That might have been trouble on my end. Yeah, I think so. Excellent. So um, wh while Tom gets his uh, PowerPoint up, I'll do a few housekeeping items. First of all, everyone, I want to welcome you with us this morning. I uh, appreciate you rolling with the punches as we sort of adapted this uh, workshop to a virtual one. Uh, it seemed at one point like we were good to go on an in-person talk. And uh, as uh, COVID numbers continued to increase, we had um, just to, to make the call to switch this over to an online virtual event. Um, I think ultimately we're sacrificing a little bit of value in terms of in-person instruction, uh, but we're gaining a lot with uh, the amount of people that we can reach and doing that safely and getting you guys some good information on Oaks and all the problems that we're seeing with Oaks around the Missouri River corridor, particularly Eastern Nebraska, but uh, this is wonderful information uh, throughout the Great Plains for Oaks and, and what we're seeing going on with them. Um, I would also like to mention that we have ISA, NAA, and, and SAF uh, CEUs available. At the end of the session, I'll be asking for names and email uh, for individual, um, you, you're going to need to tell me your name, uh, what organizations that you need credits for. And uh, I don't think I need an email from you because not everybody's comfortable with sharing that in the, in the general chat. Uh, but if I at least have a name and um, which organizations you're going to need credits for in the chat, I'll be calling for that close to the end of the session. So please don't put that in the chat just yet. We want to wait, wait and make sure that you stick around for the whole thing and then we'll get you your credits. So uh, trying to think of any other general housekeeping. Um, it's great to have all you with us. We've got a number of different states, agencies and uh, public and private representation. So it's great to see a nice mixed audience for everybody. And um, this, this workshop sort of came about from what I perceived as some confusion and uh, a lot of interest around what we're seeing going on with, with particularly native oak stands in, uh, in, in urban areas. But as we'll hear from Dr. Harrington and Lindsay and Sarah in Iowa as well, uh, this is happening you know, out in, uh, in nature, so to speak, as well. So it's not necessarily just a disorder or a problem associated with uh, urban stress factors in particular. We're going to um, get into all that. We're gonna hear about bur oak blight, a bit about um, oak wilt, how to manage these things. And then we're gonna get into a lot of the other problems, the insect and disease and abi abiotic disorders in oaks as well. So that you as homeowners or practitioners or educators are able to competently tell these different problems apart from each other and give solid recommendations to uh, your clients or partners or customers on how to uh, move forward with dealing with these problems. So um, as Kent mentioned in the, uh, in the chat, you can send me a private chat as well. Um, I like to not assume that everybody's comfortable with the chat, but you can uh, choose to send a message to me uh, directly instead of sending that out to everyone in the general chat. Thank you, Kent, and good to see you with us today. So, um, Dr. Harrington, I think we need to, uh, I'm, I'm seeing your presenter preview. Oh, uh, you're not seeing the whole thing, huh? Yeah, yeah, so um, you can switch your, your view options there. And uh, yeah, Kent, we'll, we'll ask for all that information towards the end of the session kind of around 12 to one o'clock, depending on how sessions go, uh, our end time will vary a little bit. So, excellent. 
Um, Dr. Harrington, good morning. How are you today? Good morning. A little wet. Raining yeah. Still, but. What kind of rainfall numbers are you guys seeing in Iowa? Uh, we're seeing a lot of intense storms, so it's real spotty, but okay. we've been getting a lot of rain last week or so. Yeah, I haven't been dumping my rain gauge out uh, regularly, but I had three, four inches in it this morning when I dumped it out. So wow. uh, that's over a couple different rainfall events, but still a significant amount of rain. Really nice to get that coming into fall, I think. Yeah, better than the dry soils I thought we were going to have. But. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, Dr. Harrington, as some of you know, has, uh, is a pathologist with Iowa State University and um, has been studying, you know, different problems with, with uh, you know, predominantly conifers back east and now uh, turning to deciduous trees a bit more and looking at uh, tabakia, discovered a, a, a new named species of tabakia, Ioensis, that is particularly nasty and vir virulent in, uh, in oak species. So Dr. Harrington, it's great to have you with us today. And I'd just like to tee you up to get started with our talk on bur oak blight. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. I wish I could be there in person with you, but, uh, but this will do. Uh, so I'm gonna primarily talk about bur oak blight, but I wanna do a bit of an intro on uh, bur oak and bur oak savannas and uh, some of the insect and disease, well, one insect and some other diseases that are either uh, interacting with bur oak blight or confused with bur oak blight too. So there's been a lot of misdiagnosis, uh, certainly in Iowa and Minnesota with oak wilt and other things, and maybe similar things are going on in Nebraska. So, hmm. so the uh, bur oak savanna forest uh, could be depicted in this old uh, uh, painting from Carroll County Conservation Service, where I was given a talk similar to this, and they had a nice painting here outside in the, in the lobby. And I took this photo to kind of remind myself and you that uh, much of what we see with Burr Oak in Iowa, anyways, is uh, remnants of this oak savanna forest type, you know, where the trees were very scattered. Um, and it wasn't dense groves of bur oak, it was just a few scattered trees. And that was because the bur oak was um, a fire resistant. And so in order to maintain an oak savanna forest, you have to have regular fires. And we have that on about 7,000 acres in the Midwest out of a, what was estimated as about a 30 million acres of oak savanna forest in the Midwest. So we have very little of this true oak savanna left. Uh, so what we had before were scattered bur oaks, and then with fire suppression, we now have uh, these dense groves of bur oak, which really aren't natural. So there was a taproot that was uh, resistant to uh, fire before the prairie fires would go through, kill off the young shoots, uh, but the taproot would survive and re-sprout, and after many uh, decades or so of re-sprouting, eventually uh, a tree could get established but with enough uh, thick outer bark to resist fire. And, uh, but there are very few of these trees that uh, survived the fire. With fire suppression then, uh, we had a cohort of uh, uh, saplings that sprouted out at about the same time, about 150 years ago or so, depending on the site. And these uh, cohorts of uh, bur oak are what we try to manage today. They're highly valued uh, trees. Uh, some construction um, going right up to the trees causes problems because of wounds. And a lot of the primary agents that we see on uh, bur oak in these old uh, remnant groves are uh, associated with wounds, notably oak wilt and uh, root rot. So those are the couple of the major um, primary agents. And then we have these secondary agents. These are insects and diseases that come in on stress trees and they tend to finish off the trees. So we have these primary agents. Oak wilt though can finish off a tree, but these others usually do not kill the trees directly. And then these secondary agents. 
The main secondary agent we have in oak is two-line chestnut borer, a uh, close relative of the emerald ash borer. And here you see the crown dieback associated with emerald or two-line chestnut borer. Um, but there are other things that could stress the trees that make uh, the uh, trees vulnerable to this secondary agent. Botryosphera tip lights, another primary agent, but this or a secondary agent because it goes for um, weakened trees. And we see this quite a bit, mostly in the form of a tip light where you see clusters of dead leaves at the ends of tips, uh, often on trees that are stressed by some other agent. It can result in more serious cankers and you can get branch dieback and, and eventually death of tree with Botryosphera canker. But uh, that isn't as common as some of these root rot pathogens. So here's uh, fruiting bodies of a root rot fungus that showed up uh, many years after the decay got established, probably at this old wound here. So this is all rotten out tissue. Uh, and in managing these 150 to 200 year old uh, bur oak, they commonly have root rots in them, even if you don't see the fruiting bodies associated with them. And in oak, unlike some of the other tree species, we don't frequently see these root rotted trees uh, breaking off and uprooting like this. Instead, um, the pathogen just keeps encroaching on the sapwood tissue, uh, resulting in branch dieback. Oak wilt, uh, I don't want to get, get into this too much because I think we're going to cover it later. But in burr oak um, and in the white oaks, we see leaf symptoms that kind of look like burr oak blight, but they are distinct. And in oak wilt, you find this discoloration in the branches, um, and you really have to isolate the fungus in order to confirm you have oak wilt because oak wilt's really frequently uh, over. Um, over um, Diagnose. So here's a, a reference uh, from our extension service here on how to collect samples for isolation of the oak wilt fungus to confirm you really have oak wilt. And of course, it is in eastern Nebraska and it is expanding its range. It's not a native fungus. So this can kill bur oak trees, but it's not real common, pr primarily because it doesn't produce, the fungus doesn't produce, reproduce very well on bur oak. Instead, the inoculum for the burr oak infections comes from members of the red oak group. So you have to have a fair amount of red oak around in order to have uh, oak wilt and burr oak. So let's get back to burr oak blight. So 20 years ago, this disease was not known. There was no record of it at all. And then all of a sudden uh, there were reports, uh, uh, many in central Iowa here that were, um, uh, homeowners that were alarmed of their trees with uh, completely brown leaves throughout the whole crown. So we thought it was a new pathogen, perhaps one that was introduced. Uh, initially, it was thought that the fungus was Tabachia dryina that was causing these symptoms. This is a Tabachia microscopic shot of Tabachia fruiting body, so quite characteristic. Uh, but it turned out it was a different Tabachia. So this is dryina, the one that was well known that causes leaf spots. And then this is the burl blight fungus here, which we eventually named Tabachia ioensis. We did run across uh, other species. There's three other species that can occur on burl oak, um, but they don't cause serious disease. But we named them as new species and named them after our deceased colleagues here at Iowa State. So burr oak blight can be severe on some trees uh, and then have adjacent trees that seem to be disease free. So it's a very peculiar disease. It shows up on certain trees and then every year, year after year, it shows up on the same trees and then the green healthy trees, they stay, they stay healthy. So it doesn't spread uh, much from one tree to the next. Instead, it just builds up within individual trees. And that's the way it should be managed. The disease is managed on an individual tree basis. So the peculiar thing about this is even on severely blighted trees, the next spring they'll leaf out uh, pretty well and they'll look like they're you know healthy leaves and green leaves until um, a couple months later, then the leaves start to show symptoms. And so we say with this type of disease, we have a latent phase or endophytic phase. So the fungus infects in the spring, but lays more or less dormant and doesn't cause severe symptoms until sometime later. 
You don't see mortality of these blighted trees uh, unless there's two line chestnut borer population around. And I pointed out this, these two trees once in a local news cast and I said, you know, these trees look like they're, they're goners, but they're gonna leap out the next year. But then as it turned out, this tree didn't leap out the next year, it died. Uh, but this one's still alive. And so that was uh, uh, almost 15 years ago. And uh, it's still there. And we did inject it with fungicide once and that kind of revived it, but it's stayed relatively healthy since then. So very little mortality associated with the disease. This is another unusual tree that uh, had pretty good blight symptoms every August, September. Um, and then one year it started showing this branch dieback. And then uh, the next year it was dead. So uh, we do see some mortality, but uh, it's not common. Most trees leap out the next year, even if they have very severe symptoms. So we uh, did uh, some survey work. I wanna point out Doug McNew, who worked uh, with me many years, is retired now. Uh, and he did much of the survey work, but we had collaborators all over um, uh, throughout the range of Burr Oak to try to see how extensive this disease was. And here's a place in, uh, on Oak, off of Okaboji Lake that shows uh, Burr Oak Road and Burr Oak Lane. And we had Burr Oak blight there. It's, it's a bad uh, disease up in the Iowa Great Lakes area and other places too. We found that one of the best places to find uh, Burr Oak blight as we were doing our surveys is go to old cemeteries because cemeteries tend to be placed on these uh, upland uh, former oak savanna sites, and that's where we tend to find bur oak blight. Uh, on the, in the Less Hills, for the most part, we don't see very much disease. There, there is little pockets of it, but much of the bur oak um, doesn't seem to be very susceptible to bob there. So these are well-drained soils, and we don't seem to have much disease. Um, and then we have on bottomland sites, we also find very little uh, bur oak blight. Sometimes we do, but uh, most of those bottomland sites do not have the disease. And then as we looked at the distribution of the disease, we see it's pretty tight area within the broader bur oak distribution pattern. So this is a very small area. And then we found out that uh, you know, some people claim that this is a different variety of burrow, variety of leviformis, because the acorns are small and kind of olive shaped or about the size of an olive. Uh, and then we have the more typical macrocarpa variety, macrocarpa. This has the one that has the one to two inch um, uh, acorns, so really big acorns with this variety. And this is primarily a bottomland species. And then up in the Dakotas in very well-drained soils, we have this variety Depressa too. But we're seeing burrow blight on this, what we think is variety of Leviformis. But you know, oaks hybridize and these different varieties, if you wanna call them varieties, uh, certainly hybridize too. And on upland sites, we tend to get in Iowa more of this Leviformis type. If you go to Southeast Iowa and look at bottomlands, we get this big acorn type. And here's the big acorn type from southeast uh, Iowa, uh, bottomland site, and this is typical upland bur oak in uh, central Iowa, much smaller, much, much smaller acorns. And it's this variety here that's the fire adapted species that would be the upland oak savanna forest type, and this the bottomland species. And we see the disease only on this type, small acorn type. So here's a planting that had three different types of oaks. This is an aim. So here's a, the small acorns of this tree here. And you can see it's pretty well blighted out. So this would be in, uh, in August as symptoms start coming on. And then right next to it was a swamp white oak. And the swamp white oak had a little bit of leaf symptoms, but not very severe. And it, not the blighted type where the leaves uh, completely die. And then Here's another bur oak that was in the same planting and it had larger acorns, about an inch across, um, deep lobes here. I don't know what this cultivar is or if it's a hybrid, but it's commonly planted. And we, we never see bur oak blight on this type of bur oak. We see a little bit on swamp light, white oak, but not on, not on bur oak. So the fungus is pretty particular on what kind of tree it infects.
We use this rating system here uh, that's really looking at the distribution of the disease within the tree. We cut the crown in half and rate the upper half and the bottom half and then add them up to give a disease rating. So uh, zero for no symptoms, less than a third of the area covered, we call one. If it's about a half of the crown, upper crown covered, we count it as a two. Or if it's greater than two thirds, we count it as a three. So throughout the crown here, this particular tree has a five and five and six ratings are, are pretty high for what we consider high. So, so we looked around uh, and Doug McNew did this and uh, surveyed year after year from 2009 through 14, the disease severity, the average severity for that particular stand or grove. And so these are the number of trees in each grove here. And so if you look at the Ames Cemetery here, this is an upland site where the cemetery was put in, typical for, for Iowa cemeteries and upland cemetery. Um, and you can see over this time, the disease progressed pretty steadily. And then this largest uh, plot area, this grove here at Brookside Park is a bottomland site. And the disease progressed there too, but less than the upland. And so the four upland sites in general, we saw more uh, borough blight than in the bottomland sites. And this is what we've observed across the state. So one question we had here, besides this unusual um, occurrence of the disease on upland sites, and not so much in bottomland, was how does the fungus overwinter? And this is often key to management of the disease. And what we found here was uh, a bit surprising. Burrow should lose all of its leaves uh, if it's on a healthy branch, uh, but during the fall. But in this case, we were seeing a lot of dead leaves hanging on the trees through the winter. So this is actually getting almost to spring. Um, and we have all these, uh, leaves hanging on them. And we weren't seeing that on trees that didn't have bob. We were only seeing it on bob trees. In fact, we found that we could predict how much bob we were gonna have on an individual tree by how many leaves overwintered on the branches. And if you look close at those overwintering leaves, here's the petiole here attached to the twig and that abscission layer um, uh, never upsized. Uh, it, uh, it was killed by the fungus. This leaf is firmly attached, and then you get these black fruiting bodies start to develop the next spring. And it's those black fruiting bodies that lead to the infections the next spring. So this fungus, if it infects early, uh, when the leaves are still unfolding, it doesn't actually um, cause any symptoms for a couple months. It goes into this endophytic or latent phase. And so what we see with the uh, years that we have a lot of bob is we have good spring rains, warm and wet springs. The spores splash from these pustules to the neighboring leaves, infect those leaves, and then we don't see symptoms usually till late July or into August. So this is what we call the spring cycle, the overwintering leaves, the pustules on the petioles splash to the neighboring shoots, and then early August, late July, we start to see necrosis or death of the tissue right where the petiole attaches to the twig. And then over the next uh, few weeks, we have complete death of the leaves as this uh, petiole becomes completely uh, necrotic. If we get infections later uh, in the cycle, later in the summer, uh, when the leaves are fully expanded, First, we see these little black flecks on the underside of the leaves along the veins. The fungus likes to infect veins and grow in the vein tissue. And if it causes death of adjacent veins, then you get coalescence of this necrotic tissue and it dies. So that's pretty typical of summer infections. There's a different type of fruiting body that develops on the underside of these summer infected or summer killed leaves. So we have two different cycles then we have with wet springs we get uh, this blight symptom where the leaves die and remain attached to the tree 
and that's what leads to overwintering and that but we can also get this summer cycle here repeating many times during the season as long as it's wet and get these infections and most cases these leaves uh, fall to the ground um, or they abscise in the fall at normal time and we don't think these are important for leading to next year's inoculum. So the real critical phase we found with the disease is these um, petioles from leaves from last year with the black brooding bodies. Um, and these produce spores in the spring that splash to neighboring uh, expanding shoots and infect those shoots. And that's what's gonna lead back to the next year having more um, overwintering leaves hanging on the tree and producing the black fruiting bodies. The fungus does not move very readily. It's rain splashed and they don't move very efficiently. So it's really this inoculum pretty much stays within the tree. And we do see with good wet springs build up the disease year after year in that individual tree, but we don't see it moving to adjacent trees. So, we looked at the amount of precipitation we were getting across Iowa, and this is averaged across all the state. So we're looking at spring rainfalls that could be contributing to this early infection of the expanding shoots. Um, so we're looking at the records here, and you can see, of course, a lot of fluctuation. But if you looked at the trend line, you'll see from the mid 90s on, uh, substantial increase in spring rainfall. And this is seen throughout uh, much of the Northeastern uh, USA. Uh, it's, it's an obviously uh, an effect of climate change. It was predicted by modelers uh, before we even started working on this study that we were gonna end up with uh, wetter springs and we sure have. Um, also at night, uh, the temperatures are warmer than they were in the past. So these warm, warm and wet and humid evenings in the spring, we think are what made burrow blight noticeable. That the disease was here before, but whenever it would build up, then we'd get these drought periods where we get two or sometimes three years out of four where with substantially low spring rainfalls, that would probably knock the disease back quite a bit. And then it'd slowly build that back up. Uh, but from the mid 90s on, we really haven't seen those summer droughts. So we've lost summer droughts. It used to be a regular feature of Iowa climate, but we're not getting spring droughts. We haven't had them since 1988, 1989 were the last uh, drought years we've had in Iowa. Another way to look at this is um, look at the Forest Service, uh, US Forest Service um, in importance value of different tree species. And this is outlined here in brown, that's the borough blight distribution. And wherever you see these uh, colored um, pixels, that's where borough blight is, uh, has importance. Where you see these colors, it's less important. And you see along the prairie uh, deep woods um, interface here in Minnesota, borough blight's a very important tree species. And then kind of scattered throughout uh, Iowa, we see these upland sites, some of them large enough to have uh, show up as a pixel uh, and some not. And so what we have here is importance of, of bur oak, mainly related to this upland oliviformis type. And we believe the fungus, Tabachia ioensis, is native. And so we have a native host, a native pathogen, but a new environment. So I wanna take all these pixels here and look at how they are distributed on this chart here. So this is taking those, uh, each of those pixels, looking at the precipitation, annual precipitation at that particular pixel site, average temperature at that site. And then you see, this is the, temperature precipitation cloud here where borough blight is important. Um, so that's what it was like up until 1940. And then if you look now, this is the pre precipitation le level we get each year. And you can see it's moving outside of that uh, range where borough blight is generally considered important. So the trees grew up, these groves developed, 
in this period here, there was natural selection for a little bit of disease resistance here, but then the climate changed and there's more rainfall um, and these trees need more resistance than they have. So if these trees had been selected for with current rainfall and tobacco ioensis, uh, there'd be some selection for more resistance, but that isn't what, what we have. So this is a picture from Ed Hayes. He was retired now, but he's with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. And he's really the one that first noticed this disease showing up in the 90s. And in 2001, he took a picture of this tree uh, whose leaves were all uh, dead and they remain attached through the, the winter. And so year after year, they get bad disease. There's a few green leaves here right at the top of the crown here. But he said this tree looked like this each fall uh, up and last I heard from him was 2018. And so for those 18 years, this is what that tree looked like every fall. He said there's a little bit of twig die back in the upper reaches here, but uh, not severe. So this is not a, really a tree killer. It needs something else like the two line chestnut borer to kill these trees. This is the site where we've got the, had the most uh, mortality associated with bur oak blight. And so this was the distribution of um, number of trees with different disease ratings. The six is the worst rating. We had nine trees in 2010 with that six rating. And then, uh, our, it was actually 2009. And then the next year, 2010, four of those nine trees died and another one died in 2011. So this is the worst mortality we have, it would be five trees after this, out of this whole population. And really the problem was uh, poor sanitation. So there was a lot of branch dieback with two line chestnut borer. They left dead trees there. They cut down some other trees and left piles there for the two line chestnut borer to build up in. And so the problem was, poor management of two-line chestnut borer, and that led to the mortality of these six trees. The borer didn't kill these other trees with lower ratings. It just hit the trees weakened with burrow blight. The trees that showed the branch die back initially, maybe from the blight, but then the two-line chestnut borer started doing its thing. I want to just briefly go into uh, fungicide uh, use. Um, I, I hesitate to do this because I think uh, the fungicide treatments for burr oak blight are overdone. And I don't think they're too helpful for oak wilt either, but we tried it. So we use propiconazole, that's the systemic fungicide that's been used for um, oak wilt. It's injected into the tree, either by this traditional Alamo method where you bore into the tree, you connect all the tubing together and with low pressure, you pump in uh, so much active ingredient of propiconazole. The, Fungicide is diluted quite a bit to try to reduce the amount of phytotoxicity. You can also use this Arborjet system, which uses a more concentrated uh, uh, propiconazole, and that works too, although you tend to get more phytotoxicity with that method. So we have also seen uh, Arbortec, a benzimidazole compound that's been used for uh, Dutch elm disease uh, management, uh, and it causes pretty bad phytotoxicity, but it also does control the disease, although we don't have data on it. The only data we have is on propiconazole, and it can produce phytotoxicity like this, but it's kind of a brief jolt. Uh, sometimes we even see a, a branch die with uh, propiconazole injection, but that's not common. If you use high concentrations, you can kill off all the leaves, but uh, the leaves will new leaves will sprout out later, uh, but there's a definite trade-off between the effectiveness of fungicide injections and the amount of phytotoxicity you have to put up with. So bur oak's pretty sensitive to chemicals. So this is uh, the, the main study we did, the initial one. Uh, so this was in one grove in Ames where we had uh, pretty severely diseased trees. So we just used trees that were in that four or five category of um, Bob, we had four trees per treatment. So this would be the average disease rating from 2009 through 13 for the four control trees. Um, we injected the trees in May and spring 
of 2010. So at this point here, and you can see later that fall, the injected trees had much lower um, disease ratings. In fact, though, not every tree responded to treatment, only some of the trees. So this is the average ratings here. In general, about two thirds of the trees that have been injected that arborists have done, at least the ones we know about, and in our treatments, about two thirds of the trees seem to respond to injection. And that lasts into at least into the next year and sometimes into the year after that. And then by 2013, that would be the fall, three years later, uh, we're starting to see disease build back up again. And we wouldn't recommend treating trees until they built back up to this level. And so if we injected in 2010 uh, in the spring, we wouldn't consider injecting again until 4, 000, uh, 2014, four years later. So this isn't the type of thing where you wanna inject the trees every year or every other year. It's just too uh, stressful on the trees to have all those drill holes in them each year. So uh, we recommend just waiting, not a regular schedule, but waiting for three or four or more years before injecting the same trees again. This is from another study. I won't show you the data, but it was pretty comparable. But uh, the dramatic effect, at least the first year after injection, or it was, was certainly there. So this is the control trees that weren't injected, again, in a cemetery. This is up in southern Minnesota. And then if you look here on the right, these were two of the trees that uh, were injected. And later that year, they looked pretty good. Even the next year, uh, there was a little bit of blight scattered throughout the trees uh, in the following year, but um, it wasn't nearly as severe as what we were seeing in these uh, severely blighted trees. So the propiconosol injection does, does work. So here's some considerations here. And if you want more detail on this, I do have a video on my website with a link to about a 20 minute uh, video that's more geared towards fungicide treatments, but propiconosol doesn't always work, but that's what we have. Uh, expect some phytotoxicity, uh, only treat the moderately to severely diseased trees. There's no need to inject healthy trees. You're not protecting trees with these injections. Uh, we only tried springtime uh, treatments and these are after the leaf is fully expanded, but the fungus has already infected those particular trees. So um, you have to eradicate the fungus with these systemic fungicides. And then we don't treat again until after the symptoms start to build back up. So for general recommendations, we say with burrow blight is don't panic because almost all these severely defoliated trees will leaf out the next year. Uh, maintenance of tree vigor is probably important to keep those secondary pests off, particularly the two-line chestnut borer. And probably the best way to manage for two-line chestnut borer, if it's possible, is to prune off the dead branches, remove the dead trees. Uh, and this kind of keeps the beetle population down so uh, it doesn't clobber your burrow blight stressed trees. Chemical control is only for high value trees and trees that have pretty bad disease levels. And then the other opportunity if you're gonna do planting is plant trees that have bigger acorns. The cultivars that have the bigger acorns just don't seem to add up to the disease. So I think I had to take down my old uh, uh, web pages, but I do have this new one up on uh, burrow blight and tabakia that has some links, distribution maps, uh, fungicide video, and some other information that you may be interested in. So with that, I think I'll, I'll stop there. So we have some time for questions. Yeah, excellent. And, and Dr. Harrington, we do have one in the chat already. Um, Alan is asking whether or not the uh, overwintered uh, leaves that drop with the uh, uh, pathogen in those petioles, is that still an issue or it's more of a problem on those leaves holding on to the tree? It's the, we think it's the ones holding on to the tree. Uh, there's probably some spores produced on the leaves that are on the ground. They would be ascospores. They'd be a different type of spore. They fly in the, in the wind, not in rain splash. But uh, we don't think those are important because we're, we're just not seeing it spread to trees. We've done uh, quite a bit of survey, uh, same grove of all the trees year after year, and we just have never seen... Um, 
movement of severe disease from one tree to an adjacent tree. You know, yeah. all the trees that we started surveying that were uh, disease, stayed disease, all the ones that were green when we started stayed green. And so um, it's just these short dispersed uh, uh, spores up in the over from the overwintering petioles on the branches that we think is important. Right. And, and as, as you mentioned, it's, it doesn't seem that the disease spreads far distances in the canopy because of that rain splash that it needs. Yeah. So there's kind of a predictability there. So what's down on the ground is probably far less likely to exacerbate that yeah. problem in the tree, the way those leaves hanging on yeah. in the canopy will. Yeah, that's right. The, 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 the problem with the disease is this slow buildup year after year within a tree. Right. And what's on the ground doesn't seem to be important. Right. So um, could you put a finer point on uh, bur oak blight versus oak wilt, those symptoms, the treatment recommendations? Uh, what should people be looking for to differentiate between those two in particular? Well, with, with oak wilt, um, well, if you look close at the, uh, at the symptoms, uh, between the two, you can tell the difference. If you have significant bur oak blight, and you're, now you're into August, September, you'll see um, the individual leaves scattered through the crown that are attached to the twig. And okay. then those will overwinter. And you don't see that with oak wilt. Oak wilt, you might see an individual branch and a lot of leaves on that branch overwintering. Okay. But not the scattered individual leaves with, uh, with, that you see with bur oak blight. And then oak wilt, you see this uh, discoloration in the twigs, um, and you really need to isolate or have a clinic isolate the fungus for you. They do that at Iowa State University, their plant diagnostic clinic, and they have a nice video on how to collect the right samples. And I, I wouldn't call it oak wilt until you, you isolate the fungus from it. Even I wouldn't be uh, uh, certain it's oak wilt until I saw that twig discoloration in the wood and isolated the fungus. Right. So watch for that pattern of foliage damage in the tree and uh, potential streaking in the cambium of the twigs. Yeah. And bur oak blight starts kind of at the bottom of the tree. So you usually see more severe symptoms on the bottom than the top. And oak wilt tends to take out the tree branch by branch, you know, where the whole branch is infected. Right. right. So it's a different pattern in the crown too. Excellent. Good to know. Um, Justin's asking about other oak species that are impacted by Ioensis. Okay, so um, Ioensis, uh, for practical purposes, only bur oak and only the, uh, the small acorn bur oak. Uh, we have seen it only, we have seen it on swamp white oak, uh, but it's not very severe symptoms and we have Bob on bur oak in those same areas. So it's probably moving from the bur oak over to swamp white oak. So we don't think it's a serious consideration. Um, and we don't see it at all on white oak. Uh, really? No. Or English or any of those other white no. types? No, but we do have other tabacchia species. So those new species that we described, Hollyi, McNabbii, um, those are on um, red oaks and uh, in other oaks. So we have quite a few. We have actually six different species of tabakia here in Iowa. Uh, none of the others cause very severe symptoms, uh, but uh, they do occasionally occur on bur oak and other tree species. So if you see that banal necrosis where you see the death along the veins, it could be one of these other tabakia species. Sometimes anthracnose will look like that too. So right. um, you have to look, look carefully. So if, it, if we're just talking about Ioensis, and that's the only serious one we have, it's pretty restricted to small acorn bur oak. Um, we do have a couple of species of tabakia that we have seen pretty significant symptoms on members of the red oak group. Okay. Uh, nothing that looked like the tree was going to die, but we've seen substantial death of leaves in the lower crown with these other tabakia. So we've seen that on red oak. Uh, sh shingle oak, um, maybe those are the only two I've seen it on. Right. So, so there is what uh, a colleague up in Minnesota called Rob, 
instead of Bob, and that's red oak blight. So <laughs> if you get individual red oaks that sometimes will show severe symptoms, but nothing you'd really get too concerned about. So as far as non-native white types that might be in the nursery trade, you'd be pretty surprised to find Baroque blight on some oddball that we really just plant in cities. Uh, I meant you, besides the red, you mean? Um, For Baroque blight. I, I hate to oh, ask okay. you to, to uh, you know, make assumptions or what, what's likely to be the, the reality, but. Yeah, it's, it. If, if you, of course, we, we see a severe uh, bur oak blight, Ioensis, on some planet bur oak trees. And we have seen it move to swamp white oak. Okay. All but, right. But it's not severe on swamp, swamp white oak. Nothing I'd be concerned with. Great. And I don't think you'll see it. And the swamp white oak that aren't around bur oak with bur oak blight, those isolated um, swamp white oak, we don't see the disease on. Okay. So uh, Sarah Browning wants to hear a little bit more about why upland uh, varieties of bur oak tend to be a little bit more uh, problematic with Ioensis. Yeah, there, it's a lot more problematic. And uh, we think it's genetic. So, you know, the uh, oaks are just notorious for hybridizing and you get introgression of one type into another. Um, and it's even controversial whether these three varieties I talked about, Densiflora, Oliviformis, and Macrocarpa, if, if those are really varieties, they could be you know, considered ecotypes and they certainly hybridize with each other. And we think like in the, at least the Northern part of the Les Hills that that has more Densiflora in it. That's that Dakota's type that is adapted to well-drained soils. Right. Um, and uh, we don't see the disease on that either. So okay. it's kind of hard to find the disease in the Northwest part of, the, of Iowa because it tends to be this Densiflora type, we think. And then we don't see it in Southeast Iowa because it tends to be primarily a Macrocarpa bottomland type. So we think these ecotypes have some genetic characteristics that uh, lend itself to burrow blight, at least the oliviformis, and that's the typical upland uh, site. One of the things I love about studying trees is, is that, you know, the, the pool of knowledge continues to roll on and expand, and there's always more to, for us to learn, and, and so yeah. the, uh, that's true for burrow blight as well, it sounds like. Yeah, I learned a lot. <laughs> it, it was quite an adventure. So it was really a fun project to do because uh, I did learn a lot. And uh, yeah. but it's controversial. I mean, there's there's people that think I'm not a very good human being because I <laughs> suggesting that there's three different varieties of bur oak. Well, you know, uh, uh, we love our oaks, and and we all yeah. get pretty passionate and <laughs> maybe a little bit ideological about it sometimes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, well, I don't know what they are, but the Tabakia Iowensis can tell the difference between these three different types of burrow. Right, and, and why that is maybe remains to be seen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jace is asking about injection methods that don't require drilling. So um, some of the other uh, infusion yeah. type systems, um, would those be any more desirable for this sort of thing? You know, I don't know, but I, I, you can, as I understand it with other trees, species and types of trees. Uh, in fruit trees and others, you can soil drench with propiconazole and they'll pick up some of the material. I haven't tried that with burrow blight. Um, you know, with these big trees, you just have to have a ton of <laughs> material. Yeah, I don't you want think a controlled dose in there. Yeah, the other alternative is to spray the crowns. Um, and I know some arborists who have done this in the spring. You have to do a couple of sprays, but that's a lot of material too. Right. The spray enough that they pick up the material. So by the time the trees have leafed out, the most important infections have already taken place. Okay. Because right? yeah, they're so taking those... place right when the leaves are expanding. And if you wait to spray until the leaves are fully out, which you'd have to do in order to get an infection, you'd have to get a lot of material in there. And I think the only way to do that is to inject it inside. 
Right. And so the injections we're recommending uh, are actually uh, hitting the fungus after it's infected the leaves when it's right. in that endophytic phase. And I just don't know of another way to get to it. Yeah, that kind of prophylactic spray that covers the leaves is not getting to the interior necessarily where the infection's already begun. Yeah, and it has to be pretty high concentration to kill those fun okay. fungi back. Yeah. How about uh, stress factors like drought? Um, does this kind of go hand in hand with burrow blight? I don't think burrow blight, the tabakia doesn't need a stress tree. So it'll affect healthy trees just fine. But if you have a drought, you're not going to get as much infection. So we had a pretty dry spring here, unusually dry uh, here in central and northern Iowa. And we have much less uh, burrow blight this fall than uh, I, I've seen since I started studying the disease. Okay. We've had a couple of years of normal spring rainfall. And now we're having below normal, not dramatically below, but significantly below normal in this area. And uh, we have less disease. So uh, drought can reduce the disease. If we get a summer drought, like we had this year up until these recent rains, uh, we get less of that summer infection. So uh, there is a relationship, but it's probably uh, more to do with the lack of rainfall that would normally splash the spores onto other leaves and then allow for uh, sufficient uh, film of water on the leaves for the fungus to germinate its spores and penetrate into the host. Okay. Yeah. And then I suppose, uh, you know, higher levels of water movement through the tree from precipitation kind of moves it a bit more as well. Uh, I think once it gets in, I don't think it really cares. Okay. Um, it does move through the veins, mm -hmm. but there's always going to be sufficient moisture for the hyphae, the vegetative phase to grow through, through those veins. Got it. And uh, once it's inside, if it's a genetically susceptible host, it's, it's going to do its thing. And how about age as, as a factor? Are we seeing this on old and young trees pretty equally? Uh, yes. So uh, young planted trees can be uh, significantly blighted enough that they really don't grow very fast. Um, so uh, we do see it on young trees. Of course, if you, when we go to these groves, there's very little regeneration of bur oak, you know, okay. in these dense groves. Uh, we don't see yeah. that much um, because they are unusually dense, <laughs> you know, uh, and they're not getting the sunlight that we need down on the floor for regeneration. Right. So. Right. Um, one more question. And I did want to point out um, that, you know, if these sessions go a little long, I think that's okay, especially knowing that they're going to be recorded for you to watch later. If, it, if you have to get off at some point because of your personal schedule, you can certainly revisit any of these, but I want to be sure that we have the time to address everybody's questions along the way here. Um, Alan was also asking about um, bur oak nursery sources from these ranges where you see less uh, problems with bur oak blight. Yeah, so um, we do see uh, some planning of, of a cultivar bur oak uh, that has relatively large acorns, not the biggest ones we've seen, but about one inch. And uh, we haven't seen the disease on that, but I don't know where that comes from. And I'm suspicious it's a hybrid, but I, I don't know. And uh, as I looked into uh, the larger nurseries up in Minnesota that grow bur oak, uh, a lot of that seed comes from the Dakotas. Um, and they ship out, the, they collect the acorns in the Dakota. This would be variety densiflora, and then grow them up in, uh, in Oregon mostly. And then uh, those one year old seedlings are shipped to Minnesota and grown up into larger trees for planting. And I've gone to a couple of those major plantings and I didn't see any burrow blight there, but that was okay. genotypes of uh, burrow from, uh, from the Dakotas where we don't see the disease. So uh, assuming it is a genetic component versus like an ecotype problem, then sourcing trees from that seed source would be a good idea for burrow blight. 
Yeah, I think so. And we didn't look into it as much as we could, but we did spend a little bit of time looking around. So I think it's pretty important where the seed source is. And I think where we're seeing the disease on planted trees with small acorns, I'm, I'm suspicious that the, this, the fungus is coming in with the stock. So I think right. clean nursery stock would be important too. Excellent. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Um, how about uh, as far as treating trees for bur oak blight, does uh, the current condition of the tree tell us anything about how likely the tree is going to respond to that treatment? Well, it does. So we've seen poor response on trees that already have significant branch dieback. Mm -hmm. So if there's a lot of branch dieback, I don't think the fungicide distributes very well throughout the crown. Sure. Uh, and so the propiconazole will go up with the sap stream pretty quick. It really moves, highly mobile. Nice. Um, and it will go into the branches that are transpiring the most. And the ones that aren't doing so well, and those might be the ones you're trying to protect, we don't get as much material into it. So, right. so if you see a lot of branch die back, uh, the treatment probably isn't gonna work as, as well. I mean, I think, it still might help, but. Yeah, and, and that's, I think that's generally true for tree injections. Um, sure. with, with branch die back, you're, you have less vigor in the tree, less movement. Certainly that branch that's already declining or dead is not getting any sort of uh, movement of product into it. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Um, well, I think we've exhausted the questions in the chat for now. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, stop the recording a second and then start it again, just so we kind of have these broken up into smaller clips that we can put on our on our page.